Hello, everybody, and welcome back to TarHeelIllustrated.com, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, we're here for part one of our top 25 UNC basketball players of all time series. We're going to be focused on the guys ranked number 25 through 20 in this one. We've also done a football series and kind of in the same criteria. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out on our channel after this one as well. We'll obviously be rolling a lot, a lot more of these out over the next few weeks too. Before we dive in, Head on over to tarillustrate.com. Sign up to be a premium member for just eight thirty three dollars a month. It's a great time to do it with the dead period officially being lifted. A ton of recruiting stuff going on right now, and it's a great time to get involved ahead of the start of football and basketball here over the next couple months as well. So after this video is done, click the description below, and you'll find a link to our website to go sign up. But, AJ, let's dive into this one, man. Before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, before we dive into the individuals, Kind of want to ask you, I asked you the similar question when we did the football one in the first one, but what's kind of your thought process in ranking these guys? What's the criteria when it comes to trying to develop a list like this? Well, first and foremost, we're not trying to prove anything. Mm -hmm. We're not throwing a flag into the sand and saying, okay, this is it. You know, this guy is the 17th best Ario of all time. This is for fun. This is for discussion. Uh, this is to get people talking about the history of the program, uh, which is something I enjoy. I enjoy it with football, I enjoy it with basketball. I'm a huge baseball history buff. So I like looking back in time. I think to, to most appreciate where you are now, you have to understand the past. And North Carolina's basketball past is unbelievable. Uh, doing a top 25 here is very challenging because we could do a top 50 and people will look at the number 49 guy uh, with tremendous amount of reverence and, and fondness, and they would look back at his career and and uh, just think about all the amazing things that player did. That's how great North Carolina's history is in basketball. So the hard part was kind of narrowing it down and, and getting the last few guys in. Uh, uh, I know that I made a late addition here with yeah. this one because it is difficult for anybody doing something like this to properly gauge recent players. Because we get used to certain players being romanticized over time with their jersey in the, in the rafters and thinking and always seeing them on a list like this. So it's a little harder to think of a more recent player and say, okay, he belongs in that group too. But the, the, what helped me, like with football, when I included Ryan Switzer, strip it down, look at the numbers. It's like the NCAA selection committee. They say they don't look at team names. They just look at the specs. So I just looked at the specs with some of these guys, and that's why number 24 made it onto the list this time, who was not on it. We previously did this thing uh, quite a while ago. So, And it's also only based on their Carolina careers. So disregard anything that happened from the minute their UNC careers ended, whenever they lost in the NCAA tournament for the final time, or if they won it all, from that moment on, nothing matters it does not factor into this so if you're the number one pick overall and you scored 30,000 points in the NBA that doesn't help you make this list yeah. it's got nothing to do with it if you were the three-time parade all America before you came in that doesn't help you get on this list mm -hmm. it's strictly from the time you stepped on campus to the time you left yep strictly Carolina careers here so keep exactly. that in mind guys when, when we run through these and going into future videos as well when we eventually count down to number one. So, AJ, let's dive right into this one, man. Number 25 on this list, Bobby Jones, a forward who played from 1971 to 1974. As we did in the football video, I'm going to run through the, kind of their accolades on this list. One thing I've noticed in contrast to football, especially at this kind of 25 to 20 mark, a lot more things and a lot more accomplishments. It was still impressive on the football side, but I think you guys will understand if you've seen that one. Once I start running through this, there's just a ton of accomplishments that these guys uh, racked up at their time in Chapel Hill. All-American in 74, first and second team, all ACC, all NIT team, Naismith Hall of Fame, 2019 inductee, and his jersey is honored in the Smith Center. You're going to hear jersey honored in the Smith Center a lot throughout this series, so get used to it. But AJ, I mean, you know, I, I think every Carolina fan, if you're a diehard Carolina basketball fan, knows who Bobby Jones is, know that just how good of a career he had at his time in Chapel Hill, a little bit before my time in the early 70s. But why, why, why Bobby Jones at number 25 on this list, in your opinion? 
Well, I think if you were to look back at Carolyn Hansberry, if you were to ask Dean, ask Roy, and, and ask the, the, the Phil Fords of the world, the people who really know this program inside and out and are, are connected with so many great players that have been in the program, they, and you ask them to name who are the five best teammates on the floor, the five guys that could mix in with any any kind of composition that you have on the floor, whether you go big, whether you go small, whether you need to run half-court stuff, whether you need to get out in the open court, whether you need to be uh, great defensively, whether you need to score a ton of points, whatever it was that was needed, Bobby Jones would fit in in any era, in any style, any kind of team that North Carolina's had. He'd be a perfect part for the upcoming Tar Heels. He would have been a perfect part in any of the previous teams they've had. There are people that would tell you that, that he was maybe one of the most efficient players in Carolina history. He shot 66.8% in a particular season, he shot 60.8% for his career, and he made other players better, and he was a dynamite defensive player. You think about a guy 6'8", 6'9", who yeah. could get out and defend. This is back in the early 70s. He could defend out on the perimeter. He could defend down low. He would keep his guy from getting the ball. When you talk about the, the perfect Dean Smith kind of player, Bobby Jones is probably that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good. I think he's a good shot on this list. I'm glad he he made the top 25 because, especially I like what you talked about him being able to step out and defend at that size. I mean, that's just that's something you see in the game a lot right now in kind of the modern era of basketball, but maybe didn't see as much back then. Well, so he, he was also on great teams. The 72 yeah. team went to the Final Four. The 74 team, they lost the first round of the NIT. But you got to understand the era. Mm -hmm. They were in the top five. They were ranked in the top five. They couldn't go to the NCAA tournament. That was the year when NC State and Maryland played that classic ACC championship, the greatest basketball game ever played in the ACC. And NC State beat Maryland. Maryland was number two in the country, number three in the country, and they declined to go to the NIT. Because only one team did the NCAAs. NC State ended up winning the national title that year, ending UCLA streak. Carolina was the third team. They were in the top five still. They were awesome. That's awesome. And uh, Bobby Jones was a big part why. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Bobby Jones. Yeah, I think he definitely deserves to be on this list. Now, move on to number 24 on it. A guy that I know every Carolina fan listening to this one is going to know and have seen play. Justin Jackson Ford It played at Carolina from 2014 to 2017. This was the one AJ was alluding to earlier that just made the list. And when I say he was just added to the list, he was just added to the list. We were actually supposed to record this yesterday. And AJ was like, no, nah, I got I to gotta tweak this one a little bit. Let's move this one on. So, Justin Jackson, the newest addition to the UNC basketball top 25. Um, get a lot of accolades in this one, which, you know, I followed Justin and got to watch him a ton growing up. Obviously won the national championship t in 17. But I, I honestly didn't realize just how successful he was once I, until I really started looking at it. ACC player in the year in 2017. <clears throat> First team All-American in 17. First team All-ACC in 2017, Naismith Award semifinalist in 2017, MVP of the National Championship Game, NCAA All-Tourney Team, Patterson Medal, All-ACC in 2016 as well, ACC Freshman Team in 2015, and obviously, like I mentioned, his jersey is honored in the Smith Center. Get used to hearing that one. I mean, I knew how good Justin Jackson was, and it was kind of fun to see where he started out as a freshman and to where he got um, in his final season in Chapel Hill, which was in 17. I mean, just – just so good that year in particular, man. I mean, just the, the ACC player of the year just was such a threat on the offensive side of the ball in particular and was a big reason that Carolina was able to win the national championship. So no, no quarrels for me on him being added to this list. I think when you look at what he accomplished in his time at Carolina, including winning the Natty, I mean, no reason Justin Jackson isn't on this list somewhere. Well, when you're the MVP of a national championship team, which he was uh, that season, I remember Joel Berry was the MOP in the Final Four, but Justin was the MVP of the team, ACC Player of the Year. He had a better season. He was a better overall player. Uh, you have to be in consideration, but you add that ACC Player of the Year nugget to it, and you have to put him in. Got to, yeah. Has to be in the list. This season in 2017, he averaged 18.9 points a game in ACC play. And that's on a club that had a lot of dudes. You know, that wasn't a team that went – one or two deep on the bench. They played a lot of guys. They had a lot of options. They went inside out. You know, Isaiah Hicks had a really good senior year. Kennedy Meeks had a good year. You know, you had Joel out there. You had a lot of options on that team. And he still averaged basically 19 points a game in ACC play. And he was very good throughout. Joel was amazing in the Final Four. Uh, but Justin was a constant. You know, Roy's first two years – 
want a little more rebounding from Justin, maybe want a little bit more toughness, a little more screw you in his game. And in 2017, he brought all that. It was a phenomenal year. When you look at the numbers and the efficiency, uh, the, the most three-pointers made in a season ever by a North Carolina player, and here's a guy 6'8 doing that. And um, I just think that when you look back at Carolina's three championship teams under Roy, look at the threes on those teams. Rashad mm-hmm. McCann, Danny Green, Justin Jackson. All of them could shoot. All of them could put the ball on the floor and get in and make buckets. And all of them were able to do some dirty work. And Carolina almost won it in 16, but they got it in 17. And I think Justin's dirty work and that added layer of dirty mentality that the team had, as you saw in Kennedy's block shot late in the championship game against Gonzaga. And the fact that they outgritted Gonzaga in that game was it a beautiful game. And Justin was comfortable. He wasn't he wouldn't have been comfortable in a greedy game earlier in his career, but he was that night. And, that's it. and he scored that. He had that dunk late in the game, basically to salt the game away. So, mm-hmm. uh, and look, two straight national title games. You know, the, the 81 82 teams played in two straight. And that certainly props up guys like Worthy and Perkins. Yeah. For sure. And so, Justin Jackson, two straight. He got it in 17. You know, a lot of people might say, uh, they might not think of him in those terms because he wasn't a dynamic player. He wasn't a highlight reel player. He was just a guy that showed up and did his job. Mm-hmm. Similar to Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones you know, wasn't going to – he couldn't dunk in his area. He could start dunking right after he left. But he, if he could, he wasn't going to dunk the ball and pound his chest and scream. Justin yelled a little bit his senior year because mm-hmm. more of that dog came out. But he's just an unbelievably efficient player and the perfect three for that 2017 team. Agreed. Yeah, he was so good that year. I mean, you can already, you I mean, I, I, you already read through that list right there. And then, you know, half, over half of his accolades from his time at Carolina were during that 2017 year. So just so impressive. And I'm just looking at the list right in front of me where I've got all my notes written down. He's got the longest list of accomplishments all out of out of the 25 through 20. Yeah, some talking. more are going to be added to some of the other guys because I'm yeah. still in the editing process. But, exactly. uh, but yeah. And, I went, yeah, I went deeper with him because – Similar to Ryan Switzer in the football one, Jacob, mm-hmm. because they're recent, we don't think of these guys in the same sense that we do thinking of guys that were greats for 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. We've only thought of them for a few years, so they haven't fully entered that realm. And that's why it's a little more challenging to stick recent players on lists like this. But I'm glad I did. He's certainly worthy of it. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe he moves up and, uh, down the road. Who the heck knows? Yeah, yeah, it may be. The 2017 be. season was so good. It, yeah, it was. It was so, such a clean, such a clean year mm-hmm. for a really, really good player. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, no quarrels for me. I think he's got to be on this list, and no doubt, maybe he moves up in the future. We'll see. But I think 24, as of right now, it is an appropriate place for Justin Jackson to be. All right, let's move on to number 23 on this list. AJ Brad Doherty, center at Carolina from 82 to 86, consensus All American in 1986, two time All ACC. His jersey's honored in the Smith Center as well. And a couple little stat tidbits right here. Ninth all-time at UNC in scoring with over 1,900 points and seven all-time um, with over 1,000 career rebounds as well. So, I mean, you know, Brad Doherty, early 80s guy, played until 86. You look at those stats just in terms of being top 10 in scoring and top 10 at rebounds at Carolina. Then you add in the two-time All-ACC. You add in the consensus All-American. You add that his jersey's honored in the Smith Center. I mean, got to be on this list somewhere, and I think 23 is a good spot for him. And he's third all-time in field goal percentage. Mm-hmm. Again, we're talking about efficiency. Bobby Jones, very efficient. Justin Jackson, very efficient. Brad Doherty, incredibly efficient player. Another guy – who wasn't going to make, uh, you know, the ESPN top 10 list or anything like that because people used to get ticked off that, you know, at seven feet. He was 6'11", seven feet, long wingspan. He would get the ball in the lower block turn and just lay it up. Mm. He'd have been the perfect player in 1972 when you couldn't dunk. Just lay it off the glass and people wanted him to dunk more. The bottom line, two points, two points. And you cannot argue with the efficiency, with the shooting percentages, uh, the fact that he had the spin move on the block. He had the drop step on the block. He felt the defender on the lower. And this is back at a time when you had other legitimate bigs in the A- all around the ACC. There were so many. Go back and look at the big men in the ACC. In, and he was going up against monsters just about every night. And the efficiency level was off the charts. Highly skilled guy. Highly competitive guy. Very young. He arrived at Carolina. He was still 16. Oh, wow. So he was a very, very young player 
and uh, contributed quite a bit. His first two years here, he was on the uh, 83, 84 teams. 84 team was when uh, Jordan's last year, they were undefeated in the ACC. Kenny Smith doesn't break his wrist that season. I think that team at least plays the, a great Georgetown team for the national title. Mm -hmm. They would have beaten Indiana. They would have beaten Virginia in the regional final. They would have beaten Houston in the, in the final four. And they would have been matched up with, uh, with Georgetown. And Brad Doherty could have a national championship ring as well. Very, very good player who will always be on this list. Mm -hmm. um, is just There's so much you could say about what Brad Doherty did in North Carolina. It's, it's interesting looking at this list, Jake, about these first three guys. They, they weren't in-your-face guys, but, man, they were supremely skilled basketball players. Exactly, and, and that's, that's what counts. You gotta, if you're a supremely skilled basketball player at North Carolina, you, you deserve to be on this list. And, yeah, I think the first three guys we've talked about got to be on here somewhere and definitely think they're in the inappropriate positions. Could move up, could move down a little bit, you know, especially like a guy like Justin. But I think Brad Doherty at number 23, just ahead of Justin right now, it is a fair place for him to be, especially consider what he accomplished uh, back in the early 80s. Let's move on to number 22 on this list, a guy that, you know, uh, many of us have heard of. I'm sure all of us have heard of the, the age bracket that listens to these podcasts. Raymond Felton, guard at North Carolina from 2002 to 2005 and I think we all remember what happened um, in 2005 All-American during that 2005 season first team All-ACC in 2005 Bob Cousy award winner in 2005 NCAA tourney all tourney excuse me team in 2005 as well going back a little bit further in his career two-time third team All-ACC in 2003 freshman All-American 2003 all-ACC rookie team in 2003, and as I've said many a times already, his jersey is, an, is honored as well in the Smith Center. I mean, Raymond Felton for me was, you know, I, I was born in 95, so that 2002-2005 range growing up watching ACC basketball was really when I started to really pay attention and understand it when I was kind of up to that age, and Raymond Felton was, you know, a guy that always stood out to me, and especially in that 2005 season. I remember during that national championship game as well, hit some big shots, showed how gritty he was, showed how much of a big-time player he was. I know NBA careers don't matter, but went on to have a very, very long career in the NBA as well. But I think what Raymond Felton, what he accomplished was great. But what he meant to Roy Williams in his early time back at Carolina, what he meant to this program in terms of – changing it from what it was like under Matt Doherty to getting it back to its elite um, place and where it really deserves to be culminating in a national championship in 05. I, I think not only was he a good player, but what he meant to this program and getting it back to where it, it had been for so long, I think can't be understated. And, you know, we might have another guy from that team coming up here soon. So stay tuned. But yeah, Raymond Felton on this list at 22, no complaints for me. Well, you probably – won't find a player who improved his perimeter shooting from one season to the next more than Felton mm -hmm. as a sophomore to his junior year. As an example, he shot a res very respectable 37.5% from three for his career, but he was at 44% his junior year, wow. his final year. And that, I think, is what lifted this team into a national championship realm. If he's still at 33 34% like he was as a sophomore, I'm not sure they become a national champion. But that was the difference. Well, there are some other things, too. I still think – I still say Roy getting Rashad McCann on the same page for the last two months of that season is the single greatest coaching accomplishment in Roy's career because that also made them a national champion. And, of course, Sean May was unreal the second half of that season. But, you, but the first three guys were highly efficient, non-highly real kind of guys. Raymond Felton was a dog. Raymond Felton could – you could give him any punch, he'd take it. And he'd deliver it right back. He was a guy at the point who could grit. He could add the finesse. He could do the beautiful things. He could do the in-your-face things. And he was just physically and mentally so tough. He was – I'm not going to go in-depth on this, but if you look at the end of that, that one year those guys played for Dory, that, that, that class, Felton, uh, McCants, May, et cetera, he was least affected by the stuff that was going on because he was so mentally tough. And I will never, ever, ever forget this story. I've told you a story before, but after the national title game uh, in, in the Edward Jones Dome in St. Louis, I was, I immediately went to the locker room 
And there was there's a rope line the tournament where you can't stand right at the locker. You have to kind of stand several feet away from it. And it allows the players and staff to come into the locker room. And I was the second one there. So some other guy in the media and myself, so I was right there, right eight feet from the locker room. And walking up toward the locker room was Dean and Michael Jordan. Dean Smith and Michael Jordan. Pretty, pretty cool moment. Stuff you get to see in the bowels of an arena after a national championship game that a lot of other people don't get to see. And you have to be careful about what you report because I believe in a lot of things being private and staying down there. But when Felton, he, it was like a, it was like a, a bend. And if you see the video after the 2017 uh, C, uh, title that I've posted before that I shot, you can sort of see how there in Phoenix and the players come around sort of a bend. Same thing in St. Louis. And here comes Felton, and he saw Jordan, and he ran up to him, and they embraced. And Felton said to Jordan, you were right, you were right, you were right. Because Michael talked to him about the mental toughness and just staying laser focused and don't let other things get in the way. And that, those conversations started when Matt Doherty was still there. Mm-hmm. So Felton's mental toughness was an enormous part of that team. And I think – if, if you were to ask Roy, he would go back and talk about that as well because that was his second team there. He, Roy had a lot of work to do to get those guys in that position. It was not a plug-and-play situation at all. But having a guy like Felton at the point, who, oh, by the way, could stuff the stat sheet when he had to, yeah. who was that kind of dog and that kind of leader out there was really, really important to that team winning the national title. Agreed. And I think he really epitomizes what – you know, from a fan's perspective, a Carolina fan's perspective, what you would want or what you would look for in, in, a, in a Carolina point guard, tough, talented, can score the ball, can pass the ball, can do all kinds of things. And I think his toughness alone and kind of reminds me of Joel Berry, kind of looking at that 17 national championship team. I guess I should say Berry reminds me of Felton, but both just extremely mentally tough guys and guys that get after it on the court and guys that hit shots in clutch moments. So, so yeah, I think Ray Felton on this list is, is a no brainer. And, you know, had a, like I said earlier, had a really, really long and successful NBA career as well, which I know doesn't factor into this, but still kind of goes to show just how good of a player he was um, playing basketball. Well, Bobby Jones did too. Brad yep. Doherty was outstanding as a pro, retired yep. early because of his back. Justin Stewart in the league. Mm-hmm. Well, most of these guys had pretty good careers, including yeah. this next guy. Made a lot yeah. of money, played for a long time, scored a lot of points. Yes, he did. That's a great segue into the next guy on this list. Number 21, Jerry Stackhouse. Ford at Carolina from 93 to 95 national player in the year in 95 first team all american in 95 first team all acc that same year as well and was also that same year the ncaa tournament southeast region most outstanding player acc tournament mvp the year before 94 and another guy whose jersey is honored in the smith center i mean the stackhouse was right around i was born in 95 funny enough i'm showing my age right here but you know jerry stackhouse was a guy that you know, I know the highlight of him at Duke always stands out in people's minds. You know, just a such an elite level basketball player. You mentioned how long he played in the NBA as well. Goes on to show just how good he was. Obviously, a coach now at Vanderbilt and was some people had him touted as maybe replacing Roy after he retired. He was his name was thrown around on that list, I should say. But from what he did as a player, particularly during that ninety five year. Yeah, particularly during that ninety five year, man, I mean I mean, what more could you accomplish, I guess, besides a national championship in 95 from individual accolades? I mean, he just won about everything you could win that year. <laughs> hey, he was so good as a freshman, he, he created a challenge for Dean mm-hmm. how to balance, should I play the freshman over the senior who just won a national title? That was kind of a tough thing, and I think the 94 team probably had some chemistry issues as a result, but he was MVP of the ACC tournament his freshman year. He was so good. And, and that one year as a sophomore, he was so spectacular at 19 points a game, eight rebounds. And this is a guy basically 6'4", right? Okay. Almost three assists, one and a half steals, almost two blocks a game. You know, people talk about how Charles Barkley, more, more than anybody else, played above his size, especially down the block. You know, West Sunsell done it in the Hall of Fame. He was a six foot seven center, greatest box out uh, artist in the history of the sport. Well, Jerry Stackhouse at his size could get the ball in the lower block and score. He got around people, got an amazing drop step, amazing spin move, but he could also score facing. He could score married ways. He could hit threes. He could drive from the top of the key, drive from the wing, go baseline. He could post people up. He could curl, catch and shoot in the lane. He could score any kind of way he needed to. It was phenomenal 
in the open court, and there was a dog in him too. He was a warrior, a battler. He combined being a warrior and a battler and, and just a, an, an elite competitor with being an incredible athlete. And, and a guy that played so much above his size when he had to and played with the quickness he would expect from his size when, he, uh, when called on as well. He was a guy that, you know, when, when, when I first saw him play a couple of times, you know, it was kind of hard to peg what he would be. Because you're like, wow, this guy's really, really talented, but wasn't supremely refined. But he worked yeah. so hard during a short period at Carolina, much more refined his game, became a much better ball handler, and uh, just the willingness to do whatever it took to win. And a lot of times it meant put a lot of points on the board. Yeah. And you mentioned that dunk against Duke. So that's, that's the greatest, that's one of the three or four greatest dunks I've ever seen from Otario. The David Noel dunk in Rump Arena was. Uh, it was an outstanding Tyler's dunk over Kenny George's one. But that dunk by Stackhouse, the reason it's number one is because of the strut after the dunk. That made it. That strut is awesome. That's the best part of that dunk. Mm -hmm. So Jerry Stackhouse, and, you know, two-year guys aren't going to maybe be as high because this is based on Carolina achievements. But he was so damn good his sophomore year that this is, I think, the right place for him. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't, you got to have him on the list. Just such a good player at Carolina. And I'm glad you mentioned the dunk like I mentioned earlier. That strut's fantastic. The best part of it. It's awesome. It's the best part of it. I don't care what anybody says. And that look on his face, like, yeah, I'm – what? You know, <laughs> like, I'm the man. Like, you know, what's he going to say to me now? He just quieted Cameron Indoor with that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely a, a dunk in a, in a moment from that rivalry that no, no 20 years from now will still be shown. So, that's going nowhere. Well, we show it every time I'm in the Dean Dome, we yep. see it a couple times. Yep. Yes, we do, man. That in the Wallace alley -oop dunk, which was yep. the same game. Mm -hmm. I know, right? You talk about some dunks that game, man. It actually, it was about the same four-minute stretch. That's unbelievable right there. Kind of hard to believe when you put it like that. Yeah, Jerry Stackhouse, number 21 appropriate i think he's got to be on here somewhere and, and i think 21 is a good spot for him all right aj final guy on this list and at least in this podcast that we're doing 25 through 20 got number 20 sean may ford it played at carolina from 2002 to 2005 i mentioned we might have another guy on this list from that 2005 national championship team and well you've got one here national player of the year by sports illustrated in 05 first team all american in 05 final four most outstanding player in 05 national NCAA tournament East region, most outstanding player in 2005 as well. And from that same year, first team, all ACC. Now even going a little bit further back, these are some things I didn't even realize until I really looked into it here in, in, in doing this podcast, second team, all ACC in 2004, USA basketball, male athlete of the year in 2004, honorable mention, all American in 2004 and another guy whose Jersey is honored as well. And obviously on the Carolina staff right now under Hubert and has, has been under Roy as well. I mean, Sean May, man, he, another guy from that 2005 national championship team that was just so good. I mean, and what he, and he not only when that 05 year, he was good, you know, in 04 as well, and going back even further than that, but just how hard he played, just how dominant he was down low. I'll never forget that Indiana game in 05. Um, obviously, he had strong connections with his dad in Indiana University and the way he played in that game. Just, just, what he was able to do at Carolina surprised me that, you know, he wasn't very successful in the, in the NBA, didn't have a great NBA career, which doesn't have any, you know, merit on this list at all. Just had to mention it. But what he was able to do at Carolina, particularly during his final year, I mean, just one of the most dominant bigs I've ever seen play at UNC. Well, I think we would have seen more of that earlier in his career if he didn't have the, uh, the foot injury yep. his freshman season. I was up at Madison Square Garden when they played Iona and he got injured. And, you know, it's amazing how things play out in life, but let's say he doesn't get hurt. They win enough. And even as chaotic as stuff was under Matt Doherty, maybe they have a difficult time firing him if they're in the NCAA tournament that year. You never know. But, uh, and I do think it would have sped up his development because he was clearly on a trajectory from day one. But man, I'll tell you what, the second half of his junior year, that's as well as any player has ever played that I've covered. And I've covered outside of just Carolina. You know, I, cover, I, I used to be amazed when I covered J.J. Reddick at Duke. And, and, uh, and, and, and what Sean did was, I think, number one. Everybody remembers the Marvin Williams put back to beat Duke that season. Hmm. But that's the greatest individual performance I've ever covered at the college level. Steph Curry and Davidson, when they beat Georgetown, was up there. But Sean May went 26-24 to win the ACC title outright, 
to beat Duke. 26 points, 24 rebounds, last day of the regular season. He, he willed his team to victory. Marvin got the shot. Mm-hmm. But without Sean May doing every – you talk about lunch bail, Sean had to toughen up a little bit when he was in school, and he did. And, man, he just brought it. He was really skilled. If you knew what kind of player his dad was, it totally makes sense that he was skilled. He grew up in Bloomington and played around those guys forever. So he understood the game, understands the game at an exceptionally high level. One of the best passing big men you'll ever find at the college level. An unselfish guy, even though he scored a ton, very unselfish, very efficient well, with how he got his points. He didn't have to, to be on the ball and dominated a ton in order to have a lot of production. Someone who had all the post moves on the block, not just getting to the rim, but the turnaround jumper. He could catch and shoot the free throw line. Uh, amazing teammate. And, and probably one of the best dudes to play in this program. And that's one of the reasons he's still in the program right now. Um, I've had a chance to talk to Sean a few times since his playing days. I interviewed him a couple of years ago. Uh, the day before they played Iona in the NCAA tournament, about the Iona game when he got injured. And uh, it was a pretty cool conversation. He's an unbelievably nice guy. Um, imagine having your dad as one of the all-time greats in Indiana with its incredible basketball history, and you're one of the all-time greats of North Carolina with an even better basketball history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sean May might be uh, rated a little low. Uh, If if anybody uh, that we've talked about can move up, I would think that over time, when you you think more and more about what Sean accomplished, it's possibly, you know, if we do this in five or eight years from now, he gets bumped up a little bit. He was so good. Mm -hmm. and, And another great teammate another great representative of the program, a guy that would have been perfect playing under Dean Smith. And uh, so he, he's an all era kind of guy. Yeah. And, you know, arguably one of the most iconic photos in Carolina basketball history is him celebrating after winning the 2005 national championship. I think he was on the cover of sports illustrated as well. So yeah, I mean, you just look at what he accomplished in 05. And I know he was good before then as well at Carolina, but barring that foot injury, I mean, there might be a lot more accolades on this list from, from his. One quick story about Sean May. Yeah, go ahead. One quick story about Sean May. Okay. I, I covered the national championship game and I was on the third row of press row and right directly behind me was Bruce Weber's wife and two daughters. He was a head coach in Illinois. I'm not going to go into everything they said because uh, we'll, the video will get flagged. But Sean just kept scoring and doing stuff. And one of Weber's daughters yelled out at one point in total frustration, expletive, expletive, expletive. Why can't you guys expletive stop that expletive guy? He's killing us. And I'll never forget because I can't remember who it was I was sitting next to. We started laughing. And I was doing a rail for the Star News at the time. And I actually put it in there. And I, I put XXX instead of expletive. It was pretty funny. That, that was the note that came out, I guess, the next day that, got, that generated the most reaction from people. Mm-hmm. And uh, he frustrated the living you-know-what out of them that night. Mm-hmm. Any, anybody who was rooted for Illinois because he's just so damn good. Yeah, he did. I mean, just such a big performance and so good. I mean, that's why he's the Final Four most outstanding player, East Region most outstanding player in 05. I know he was good during the regular season, but what he did when it mattered most in the tournament, including the national championship game, yeah, it really epitomizes just how good Sean May was in his time at Carolina. But, AJ, that's it for this list, man. 25 through 20. If you agree with the list, if you like the names that are on here, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up below. Stay tuned for the ones we'll be rolling out as well over the next few weeks. We're obviously going to be counting down all the way to number one, just like we did with the football one. If you haven't seen the football one too, go check that out as well. And after this video is done, which it will be here in a few seconds, head on over to TarHillIllustrated.com and sign up to be a premium member to just 830 three a month can't stress enough it's a great time to do it during the off season with so much stuff going on in recruiting most of our stuff we report goes on there for recruiting in way it's the only time you can find it so head on over there and sign up after this video i've been jacob turner he's been andrew jones hope you guys enjoyed this video stay tuned for the ones we'll have coming out as well like share subscribe to our channel see you in the next one thanks guys thanks